your hands together, ladies and gentlemen, for Mr. Jeff Doyle. Thank you. When I awoke that Sunday morning, there were cop cars in my park. The park next to our house on Edgebrook Drive in Lansing. My parents had moved there when I was four years old and the neighborhood was a kid's paradise. First off, we had 30 kids ages 3 to 10 within a one block radius of my house. <laughs> there was always somebody to play with. You would just go knock on the door and they would come out and play. And if you couldn't find anybody, you would go to the Gorman's house. The Gorman's had nine kids. <laughs> and, there, and there you didn't knock on the door, you just walked into the kitchen. <laughs> And you just said, is Chris here? Can he play? <laughs> it was a wonderful place. The only problem we had was that the neighborhood had this network of mothers and old ladies that watched our every move. <laughs> It was like there were security cameras on every corner. There was Mrs. Warren's across the street from the park. There was Mrs. Gorman by the highway. There was Mrs. Blauk down by the pond. And then there was interspersings of old women like Mrs. Reichert. Mrs. Reichert was the sweetest old lady that lived kinney corner from our house, two doors up. She was like a secret agent because she was always working in her yard on her flowers. We didn't pay that much attention to her, but if you did go up and talk to her and help her in the yard, she would give you candy or cookies. And the secret agent part, that was because she would never call your mother directly. She would call another mother who would then call your mother. <laughs> but what made our neighborhood perfect was the park that sat next to our house. There was a large field that we could fly kites in. And then when we got a little older, we played football every Saturday and Sunday with the kids from the neighborhood. And behind that, there was playground equipment. There was a large old metal slide, and there were teeter-totters and swings. That is, when the city decided that we were worthy and they would bring out the swings and hang them <laughs> about one month out of the year. Then there was a merry-go-round, an old metal merry-go-round that squeaked when you turned it around. And we would run around and around until somebody would throw up. <laughs> that was usually my brother, which was good. And then behind the field and the playground equipment was the baseball diamond. And we had a backstop and an outfield fence that went kind of cattywampus, if you will, to the, to the backstop, so that if you hit the ball to right field, you could pretty easily hit a home run. But if you hit the ball to left field, you had to hit the ball a mile to get it over the fence. That's the baseball field where my dad, when I was five years old, taught me how to play baseball and catch. It was where, as kids, we learned to settle disputes and how to pick teams. And and where we played until dark. And, and that was where when I was 11 years old, I remember I hit my first home run over the right field fence. It was a monumentous occasion for me. And when you did happen to hit it over the fence, it would bounce into Grand River Highway, four lanes of traffic going 45 miles an hour, and then some young, chi some young child would have to risk his life so that the game could continue. If you hit the ball more than about five feet uh, foul and left off the left field line, the third base line, it would roll down the hill and into the woods. And those woods were my favorite place. 
because it was the only place in the neighborhood that was not covered by the mother and old lady network. <laughs> we played hide and seek in the woods. We played capture the flag. When we were you know, between the ages of eight and 10, we would build tree forts. And that was joy for us. We would, we would walk through the neighborhood to the local hardware store and buy a pound of nails. Do you remember when you could buy a pound of nails and they would scoop them up out of the bin and weigh them and then put them in a bag? And then we would go to everybody's house and scrounge as much lumber as we could and we would drag it into the woods and build a tree fort. The woods, when I was 15, I took my first girlfriend there to make out. <laughs> oh, yeah. But, you know, when we came back to the house and my mother saw us and we had dirt on our knees. <laughs> well, the next day she gave me that keep it in your knickers speech, her infamous speech. I think she was trying to talk about abstinence. I just wondered what the hell knickers were. <laughs> At the back of the woods, those two acres of woods, was a creek that ran through under the highway, through the woods, and then through my backyard. And that's, and that's where we caught frogs and crayfish and where we fell in just about every day coming home sloshy and where we had real pissing contest. <laughs> Imagine six boys lined up on the bank of the creek, seeing who could pee up the bank the farthest on the other side. <laughs> we called it our park because we, we spent most of our time there. But I distinctly remember that Sunday morning when the cop cars were in the park. They were parked on our baseball diamond. There was crime scene tape around the woods. And the, the, the cops came around door to door and questioned everybody, wanted to know if we'd seen anything strange. They said they had found something in the creek, our creek. The incident that happened that day in the park transformed our neighborhood. All of the parents and the neighbors decided that the park would be a safer place if the woods were cleaned out. So armed with chainsaws and hedge clippers, the neighborhood went to work. Every bush was removed from the park. Every sapling cut down and every tree trimmed as high as a chainsaw would reach. And then we dragged all the brush up the hill into the field and started to burn it. It was like we were burning a witch. It wasn't going to do any good, but we just felt like we had to do something. And now I could stand in my backyard and I could see clearly into the woods. All that was left was the bones of the woods. I could see clearly all the way to the other side, to the sidewalk on the other side. And I could see that spot. I could see the spot where he had dragged Mrs. Reichard off the sidewalk and into the woods. I could see the spot next to the tree where he had wrapped the rope around her neck and strangled her. I could see the spot on the bank where he had raped her. And I could see the spot in the creek where he'd left her body dead. We didn't know who he was or why he did it, but he changed us. We locked our doors. We didn't walk alone in the neighborhood. And it just scared everybody. It was on that date, October 19th, 1980, that Miss Edna Reichard, my 77-year-old neighbor, 
became the first murder victim of one of Michigan's most vicious serial killers. Over the next two, the lead suspect over the next two years was suspected in raping and murdering six elderly women, four in Lansing, one in Ann Arbor, and one in Ypsilanti. He was eventually convicted of four of the murders and is now serving a life sentence in the Michigan prison system. I was 17 years old when it happened, but it scared the hell out of me. You know, we just didn't know at the time that he was going after old women. We just knew that he had killed Mrs. Reichard and that, I don't know, I guess I was convinced I might be next. It was, it was like a demarcation line for me between my childhood and adulthood. That moment when you realize that bad things sometimes happen in your paradise. There were some good things that happened. The neighborhood cleaning out the woods brought that neighborhood together and strengthened it. We started to watch out for each other even a little bit closer. We watched out for the old women. And I remember at Christmas, we put up a manger in the park and everyone came, Protestants, Catholics, all of our neighbors came and sang Christmas carols and prayed. I went back to my park recently and a few things have changed. The backstop was gone and the the playground equipment is gone and I don't know if it's because the kids all grew up or kids don't ever play in the park anymore. But the woods, the woods had reclaimed their glory. The bushes were back. It was thick and lush just like it was when I was four years old. And I guess, I guess I'm a little bit like the woods. I, you know, for a while it was hard to trust and to not be afraid walking, but now I love to walk in the woods. And I guess I learned something from my neighborhood too. So now whenever I move to a new place, I knock on doors. I get to know the neighbors. I invite them over to have a drink, to form that network, that network that I realized is what makes a neighborhood. And that network you have to have to have paradise. Thank you. Jeff Doyle.